So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. And today I'm with Mike Newman and some special guests uh, who are gonna share their stories about the, uh, how they passed the ARE. Uh, but before we get started, if you would like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, where we will feature um, a review of our building systems mock exam, you can visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. And during the broadcast, you'll have a chance to ask questions about your answers uh, among the group and also to Mike directly. Um, and if you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE prep curriculum, where we have over 40 hours of video tutorials covering all seven sections of the ARE, head over to blackspectacles.com to watch any of the free sample tutorials from the course. And make sure to stick around until the end of today's uh, episode when we'll share a special promo code for those uh, tutorials. Um, so, as you know, um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. I'm a licensed architect myself. I'm actually past the ARE uh, when it was ARE 3.1, uh, when it was ba back in, when it was nine exams. Uh, Mike Newman, who's sitting right next to me, was licensed um, in 1752 <laughs> when they used pencil and paper to administer the exam. We had to chisel days. it, chisel it in rock. <laughs> Um, Mike's also an adjunct uh, professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the founder of his own firm, Shed Studio, and he's the instructor um, for Black Spectacles Online AIA ARE prep curriculum. And today, as I alluded to, I'm super excited that we have three very special architects who recently passed the ARE with us. So first uh, is Charlie Kletcha, who apparently has a fan club. It looks like we already have some comments coming in from some of his fans, so that's good. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's, a practi he's practicing at Quinn Evans in Detroit, um, and you may know him as the former president of the AIS, so welcome, Charlie. Good to be here. Uh, and secondly, we have Jennifer Rittler uh, from Moody Nolan in Columbus. Uh, she is a graduate of Ohio State, uh, and she uh, received her master's from IIT here in Chicago. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello, glad to be here. And finally, we have uh, Josh Mings from London, Landon uh, Bone Baker uh, in Chicago. Uh, his, uh, he received his master's from Tulane, and he made a very, um, he made a point to make sure that we mentioned that he was born in the better Columbus in, uh, in Columbus, Indiana. So Josh is with <laughs> us. Welcome, Josh. Hello. Glad to be here. All right. So um, let's see. So my first question, we're going to go ahead and just sort of jump right in. Uh, my first question is going to be to Jennifer, um, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to first start talking about um, scheduling the exam and, and, and sort of the, the timing and, and you know, how you, you know, purchased and scheduled the exams. But first, I'm going uh, to launch a poll right now. We'll see how this works. Um, uh, and I guess the idea here, so I'm going to give this a shot. So... Um, can everyone who's tuned in, can you all let us know what your plan is for exam timing? So what we're going to do is we're going to take your feedback here, uh, and then we'll kind of um, uh, use your feedback as a part of our conversation. Uh, and with that, maybe I'll sort of, I'll go ahead and hand it over to, to Jennifer. Can you talk a little bit about uh, exam timing? Uh, how did you schedule the exams? How did you purchase them? How did you sort of schedule them all at once, you know, once a month? How did you kind of go about it? Sure. Um, when approaching the ARE, I, I made a schedule that was both attainable and realistic for me personally and professionally. So that meant um, doing one exam every two to four months, depending on the time of year, if I was going to be traveling or holidays and such. So that was my, you know, kind of general approach for the exam. Um, in terms of purchasing the exam, um, I was able to be reimbursed at my previous company when passing an exam, which was a, you know, it's a great thing that a firm can do for you. So I was grateful to have that uh, opportunity. And as far as, you know, um, purchasing exam materials, I was in a group of people and we would share materials. Um, and also I would get hand-me-downs uh, from, you know, people who had already passed their exams. So I was able to buy them off them for like a less reduced price. So I definitely went like a more, um, you know, trying to use my resources that I could find so I could get discounted materials was one of my, um, was one of my strategies. Everybody loves a discount. 
so quick question, Jennifer. Uh, in that two to four months, like let's say it was a two month uh, period in between, did you find that you were sort of uh, kind of relaxing for a month and then focusing for a month? Or were you spreading the work out for the two months or the four months? Uh, like how did, how did it break down in that kind of process? Sure, so um, a little more specifically, like through, um, through the summer I did, you know, two months, two months, two months, through like up until the holidays, like Thanksgiving, Christmas time, where it took like a, a little bit of break there. Um, and then, so I strategized by um, focusing on some of the more difficult exams towards the beginning of my schedule, um, you know, in the event that I would, if I would like fail an exam, you know, I took the ARI 4.0 where you had to wait um, six months to retake a test. So I, you know, I went for the more difficult exams at the beginning, um, and then so that was kind of like two. So I would schedule an exam, you know, about two, two and a half months out, and then that's when I like kind of started prepping for them like pretty intensively, um, and then I would take, you know, a week or two break afterwards before I would schedule and then gear up to start studying again. So. And it kind of varied across like all seven exams, so that's why I kind of say two to four months of time for each of them. We have a question from Jake. <clears throat> He's asking, did you focus on one set of stu study materials at a time? So did you, you know, start with, you know, the the books, you know, for for one month, and then go on to the flashcards, or did you kind of use them all together? Sure. No, I would <clears throat> I would use them all together. And of course, it, it depends on which exam you're going for. Um, for instance, like one of the um, like the site planning exam, you know, I was doing a lot more vignette studying and reading. Um, and then for like PPP, it was more using flashcards um, and reading material. But I would I would vary. So I wasn't like looking at the same material every day. I kind of changed it up just to keep it fresh instead of looking at flashcards like every day for a week. I kind of um, switch it up just to keep it different and kind of um, just to keep you going, just to change it up. Okay, good. So maybe we'll go ahead and, and maybe I'll, I'll move over to Charlie. Charlie, can you talk a little bit about uh, your sort of uh, exam timing schedule and how you went about, you know, purchasing and scheduling the exams? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I actually, my, uh, my approach to the exams was uh, originally a joke between myself and, and my then uh, boss, Nick Surface, who was the uh, exec at, uh, at the AIS. Uh, we were kind of joking around about me taking taking exams while I was serving my term as president uh, in D.C. Uh, and he made a crack about me taking all seven exams in seven straight days. Uh, and we had a good laugh about it. And the more we talked about it, the more we realized there's a great opportunity to sort of use uh, my position with the AIS to talk about licensure and and uh, and the process. And uh, so at some point, we and, and really to show off. Uh, I mean, I think you have to say you have to really show <laughs> off a bit. And to show off, you know, as a, as a bit of an ego, being president wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it kind of started as a joke, and the more people we talked to about it, the more uh, we realized it was actually a really good idea uh, strategically for the organization in terms of our, our messaging. Uh, it was, there were certainly a couple moments where I, I realized how much pressure I was putting on myself, but, uh, but, uh, but I did it. I scheduled, um, I think it was in January, I scheduled all... Uh, seven exams, or no, sorry, uh, in March. It scheduled all seven exams for seven consecutive business days. There was a weekend in the middle um, and uh, and committed to it. That was about uh, just over seven weeks out from uh, from where I was at. So I basically went from zero to 60 in a very short amount of time. I had, uh, I had about seven weeks from the time I started studying to my first test. Uh, and uh, similarly, you know, kind of went through a few different variations on on how to break down that study time. Uh, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was a big commitment. Uh, the intention all along in, in sort of making it a, a public campaign of the organization was was really less about how I did on the exams and more about making the commitment to take the exams. 
Um, this is uh, affiliated with a, a new scholarship program of the AIS called the Professional Advancement Support Scholarship, uh, which uh, reimburses uh, recent graduates of the AIS if they're able to take and pass an exam within a year of graduating. Um, so again, the message being, uh, don't put it off, get started early. Um, just Even if it's just getting past that first exam, um, that makes it a much less uh, scary and mysterious thing kind of looming on the horizon. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of my uh, my origin story with the ARE. But uh, just to be clear, you were at that point not working a full time job, is that right? Uh, I I was working a full time job, not with an architect. Uh, the the AIS position, uh, the officers are our full time employees of the organization. So okay. I was I was working full time in association management, uh, which was actually more more of a 60 to 80 hour a week job. Uh, but no, I was not uh, not in a firm and and hadn't actually ever. Worked in a you know in an architecture firm. I'd done a an internship with a consulting firm during grad school, but um, had no experience in uh, setting A as of as of that point. So Charlie, then I have a question. So if you took uh, seven exams in seven days, uh, talk about how much time you, again you gave yourself uh, to actually prepare for these. Sure. So. Um, yeah, so I, I had, uh, like I said, seven weeks. If for some reason, I just fell in love with the number seven. <laughs> so I had seven weeks leading up to the seven exams in seven days. Um, initially, I, I had uh, intended to kind of do, okay, Sundays are CDS, Mondays are PPP, Tuesdays are... Um, but I, I realized kind of in the course of preparing for them in, in such a rapid succession, uh, it, it kind of uh, illuminated for me how much overlap there is between a lot of the exams. Uh, and so that kind of shifted that mentality pretty quickly, and I started going more by, um, you know, prep format. So more like during the week, I'd read study guides, or, you know, on my commute, I'd read study guides, and then in the evening, I'd do practice exams, and on the weekends, I'd, uh, you know, watch some videos, uh, or things like that, um, and trying to try to mix it up throughout the week uh, from different sources and different formats to kind of reinforce what I was learning. Yeah, the overlap is interesting. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting comment because there really is a, uh, quite a lot of overlap between the different exams. Okay, um, so uh, let me then ask Josh, can you talk about your exam timing schedule and how you um, schedule the exams? Sure. Um, so I actually started imme almost immediately within a few months after graduating uh, in 2012. And for the first um, five exams, I actually kind of did the whole two to four months uh, a thing that Jennifer had done as well, but I was finding that I wasn't really studying until about a month out of the exams. And also kind of with that spacing, I was letting other things in life get in the way, like work stuff and, you know, personal stuff. And plus, the summers here in Chicago are very, very uh, great, and you're easily enticed to go outside instead of study. So, um, but after that, so... Um, some other things that happened, and then getting fast forwarding to this year, I kind of just, once March hit, I just decided I had three remaining because I had failed one of the previous ones, um, that I just wanted to get them all done. So I did once a month, I did one in March, one in April, one in May to finish up. And that actually, it seemed to really work for me, um, the one per month. and. We had a good mix of, I had the Kaplan guides and the flashcards that the office had had. Um, so I used those quite a bit. And then some YouTube videos regarding the vignette and then just practicing the vignette um, with the uh, NCARB software as well. Okay, good. That's a nice kind of, kind of blend there with Charlie doing it in seven days, Josh, you in a month, and then Jen, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the two to four month range. I'm uh, disappointed, Josh, that you felt the need to have a private life uh, that you weren't just willing to devote everything to, to this. But okay. <laughs> uh, it's interesting here. So the results of our poll, we had 40% um, uh, of the folks. Um, so we had 71% uh, actually vote. Um, and 40% said they're taking an exam every two months. 31% say they're taking it once a month. And 30% uh, of the people say they have no schedule um, 
and only 3% of the people are as brave, or about as brave as you, Charlie, taking it once a week. So <laughs> thanks for everyone for uh, providing a little feedback. Yeah, that's fascinating, actually. So we'll maybe move on to the next question here. Um, and maybe this applies, and I guess you can all sort of comment on this. Maybe I'll uh, start with you, Jennifer, first on this one. Um, so, and then we'll go through each, each of you to kind of get your feedback, both from your own personal experience and just in general. But what do you think holds you back from taking the exams faster? Um, I would say time and money are both factors when you're um, creating your schedule. Um, I think personally why I didn't want to take more exams back to back to back. I didn't want to put the pressure on myself personally to perform to that level. And I had a, I still had IDP credits to earn, so that was going to take, you know, um, X amount of months through, you know, while it's taking exams, since, you know, you need to finish your IDP to get your license and finish your exams. So I knew there wasn't as much pressure to finish them, like, in rapid succession. Um, and I personally just didn't want that pressure on myself. So, and yeah, I think that's um, one thing that prevents from taking them faster. And of course, like money, that like they're expensive tests. And if you know, if you're you don't have the money for it, or you know, you're um, you have to put out you know two hundred fifty dollars for the exam and materials. It's a big like financial investment. And like coming out of school, you know, it's it's hard to, you know, put that money up sometimes, especially you know if you live in a big city or whatever your personal situation is. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Josh. Yeah. So um, I again kind of had the same thing as Jennifer. I was finishing up my IDP. So the in the initial ones, you know, it's just spacing it out. Um, to go along with IDP as well without really a need to go super fast and condense down the schedule until it got to the ones earlier this year when I had finished my IDP. And so that was one of the reasons why I decided, all right, I just need to do one a month until I get done. Um, and another part of it is I actually took a bit of a break. Um, I mentioned previously I had failed one of the exams. I took a bit of a break after that one. Um, and um, some things that come up uh, personal-wise that ended up kind of having me do even larger of a break than I had anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I ended up switching to just doing, you know, one a month until I was finished. Sure. Um, Mike, did you have a comment? Yeah, just I, I think it's you know one of those things that. A couple of things that have come out of what you guys have said so far on this is that uh, if the IDP is going to take a certain amount of time, there's not really a huge rush to get things done before that happens. And so kind of using that as part of the guideline for your, your thinking about it and when you're putting these things together seems to be one of the things that you're suggesting, um, which kind of makes sense to me because the exam is actually written essentially for somebody who's been in the field for at least a year or two. Uh, like it's meant that you have some experience. And so, you know, building up that experience, building up your IDP, and then uh, using that IDP uh, timing as sort of, well, I might as well get it done by then, uh, seems like a really rational approach to me. And maybe that's a good transition to Charlie, who, you know, obviously, Charlie, you know, you took it about as fast as you could probably take it. Um, and interestingly, of course, you took it with, um, I don't know, close to zero of your hours for IDP. So can you, so you didn't have that experience, yet you were successful. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, um, taking it at that pace? And, you know, do you advocate for that pace um, now that you've done it or, or not? Um, I think there are... There are a lot of pros to it. I, I often say that, that there were some serious uh, advantages to the way it used to work back before the tests were, were split up um, that have kind of gone away that we've kind of forgotten about. Uh, um, the, you know, back in the day when it was, it was for, I'm often reminded by my elder peers uh, who heard about what I did that uh, they used to take the exam in four days straight, uh, so seven days is not impressive. Like, like a real architect, time. I might point out. 
Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I have to. It's it's by constitutional <laughs> law. I have to say that when mm. uh, I completely when understand. <laughs> um, so it, it, I think in back when it was only offered once, you know, once or twice a year, uh, there was a certain sense of camaraderie built into it that that doesn't exist anymore. I think um, preparing for it now, however you plan it, uh, if you're not proactive about um, kind of finding a, a support group, whether that's other people that are studying for it or just uh, people in your firm or family, um, it can be a very lonely road if you if you let it. Um, and, and so I, I think there, in that sense, there's a certain um, uh, epic and gratifying quality to to just sort of busting through them all at once and and doing it the way they used to do in the old days. Uh, you know, back when they were carving on on stone tablets like Mike did. Um, it, I don't necessarily advocate it. It is very expensive. Uh, it's it, it requires a significant amount of, of commitment, and dedication to to kind of put in the time to to study for it all at once. Uh, because of the situation I was in, my wife was uh, a thousand miles away uh, back in Michigan uh, while I was in D.C. So I really had no problem kind of giving up what little social life I had out there. Um, I was you know studying. Like I said, I had an hour and a half commute each way, so I studied on the way into work, on the way back from work, and then three or four hours a night, um, pretty much solid for those seven weeks. So it was a a, a grueling and brutal uh, lead-up process, but um, you know it paid off. And, and again, kind of coming back to the IDP question, I I knew that without having any formal experience, I I had to compensate by um, studying. Mm-hmm. All that much more. Um, right. Thankfully, the, there are a number of resources out there that help, and, and I'll, I'll say plainly, the the uh, Black Spectacles video series is, is a great way of identifying where the gaps are in your in your current understanding, or kind of checking in with yourself on where you still need work. Um, so, especially when you're coming from a situation where you don't have a whole lot of professional experience, uh, identifying those weak points is huge in, in being able to make a realistic study plan. You know, that's a really good, yeah, I, interesting point. I um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, no, yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with what Charlie's saying. And I think it's also something to add that, you know, you have a different mentality from like student life and professional working life. Um, you know, coming out of school as a student, you're in that, you know, you have that study mentality, um, you know, putting in those extra hours and, um, you know, prepping for exams is just kind of a natural thing that you're used to doing. But then, you know, work it, you know, we start working, work gets in the way, and it's another priority, and you kind of lose like that, you know, student life, I'd say, that student mentality. So I would, you know, just looking back on it, I, you know, would advocate that people start taking their exams as soon as possible. Um, yeah. Maybe one question, this would be sort of interesting. I'm going to just throw this out to you, Mike. Um, you know, back when you did take it, when it was a very, very, very different arrangement, you know, four days consecutively um, every six months, I think, is how it was offered, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was actually once a year, and then the design wow. exam was every, was a, uh, there was a six-month So just out of plain curiosity, how did you guys uh, prepare for that? Yeah, well, we, uh, probably very similar to the way that, uh, um, that Charlie did, we, uh, we'd spend a bunch of time uh, just kind of running through. We had some live classes. We had, uh, uh, you know, some Kaplan. Actually, it wasn't Kaplan books at that point, um, but the Ballast books I used a lot. Um, uh, a few other sources. The flashcards had just come out, um, maybe a, a year or two before when I took it, um, and they weren't all that good yet. They invented, <laughs> this was when they invented paper. Right? Yeah, it was a, still inventing the, the flashcard concept. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we just and uh, just kind of ran through, uh, and I just to try to not get bored. I would, you know, uh, read until I was bored on one topic, and then I'd read until I was bored on a different topic, and then just kind of keep cycling through, hmm. and that worked pretty well. Um, the class was very useful. Uh, I now teach that class, um, but uh, that was a very useful uh, thing for me. Though it also threw us off a bit because there was a bunch of things that uh, they kind of had wrong in that. Um, and so, you know, it, there was a bunch of positive and negatives. But, what, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing out of what you guys are talking about is, and it, I think you've all three of you have been um, much more deliberate than I was at the time, uh, is 
figure out, like make a game plan, like figure out what you think works for your life slash work slash uh, desire to get it done. And, uh, you know, just be really conscious about the decision making and then just do it. But as Josh pointed out, okay, just because you did that doesn't mean you can't revisit it and change it up again. But that idea of like make a schedule, tr test it out, see what you think, run through it. Uh, and I've said many times, many of you have probably heard me in other scenarios say, you know, if it weren't for the money, uh, there'd be no reason not to just go out and sign up for all these and just take them all right away. Uh, because you would learn a huge amount about the exam itself by taking them. Uh, and there is, you know, nobody needs to know if you failed one. Uh, so there's really no repercussions to that at all, except for the fact that it costs you money and it's a pain to have to do it if more, more than once and all of that, uh, the obvious things. But um, you know, the thing here is find a system that works for you, like think about it and then do that and then keep reevaluating as you go along because otherwise you can just sit there for years uh, waiting for the, yeah. the right moment to come up. I think it's interesting. Um the idea of just sort of take that idea you, you, you advocate for. I tell people about that all the time, Mike. Um, and you say, although it does cost money, and if money wasn't an object, which we all know it is an object, um, but um, I mean, any of you, um, Charlie, uh, Jennifer, Josh, maybe you can comment on this. I mean, um, essentially, the faster you get licensed, the faster you can take advantage of that raise that many architects get uh, after they get licensed which in many cases, you know, might compensate. In, in many cases, it, it, it's, it's more than the exams cost. Um, and then also, you know, firms do pay for you to take the exam in some cases. Um, can you guys comment on that? On that? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think Mike's point is, is absolutely crucial that making a realistic study plan. And um, I love, I, I think we said it in one of the videos was the best way to study for the exam is to take the exam. Um, I think it's it's worth stating plainly that if you're not if you're totally in exam mode and you walk into one of those tests for the first time and you're not thinking about um, you know getting frisked and putting your entire all of your worldly possessions in a locker and getting a <laughs> metal detector waved over you that can th totally like throw you off your game if you're thinking about you know contract docs and and all of a sudden they come at you with a metal detector um, it can be a little bit jarring so yeah making a plan and 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 if you can, just go take one. Worst case is you fail, but you know a lot more about how the test works. Best case is you pass one without studying, and that puts you way ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is a good point. Um, back to uh, Mark's question. Um, so yeah, like for me, um, I was working at Kensler in Chicago at the time, and I got my license in uh, well, spring 2014. So, you know, once I passed all the exams and I had, had had my IDP completed, you know, I was able to go into my boss and ask for, you know, get my raise for being licensed. So that's, I mean, it's obviously a great incentive in that sense. And also, um, they would pay for any exams that I would pass. So, you know, you put the money up front, and if you pass, you, I would get reimbursed for it. And that's a policy that they have, like, across all their firms. Um, and it's also, you know, there's a good financial incentive for, um, you know, there's, um, they would reimburse you for also, like, couple classes you could take at um, AI Chicago. Um, they would reimburse for that. And also there was, like, a group of, um, you know, a group of, like, study materials that was passed around to people that you could rent out and check out. Um, so, you know, those kind of resources at like a large firm were really great, um, but you know I know at like smaller firms there's not you know those kind of financial resources there, but um, it's always worth you know talking to your boss um, while you're doing the exams to see like how they can support you because they know it's a you know it's difficult financially and and like you know time so I think just talking with your bosses and managers and um, just ask them ask the question what they you know, how they can support you. Yeah, I'm actually um, at one of those smaller to medium-sized firms, and the way um, our office kind of supports it is that they don't pay for the exams, but they will pay for your time to take the exams. 
So it tended to roughly equate to about them paying for half of the exam, which is which is okay because we also had study materials um, in our materials library, and so I did not have to spend any money on study materials. So it kind of all equates out. Um, and as another way that they really supported it was that a lot of the licensed architects here, I could just go ask them questions whenever I wanted. And everybody here has always been really supportive of, and really um, good about offering explanations for any questions that you have, be it work-related or test-related. Um, so for instance, one of our senior associates on the flashcards, like on the answers, just had tons of individual notes that actually really helped me out um, studying as well. Um, and as far as once you complete your license, yeah, it's definitely pretty good to go in um, to your bosses and be like, hey, um, I'm licensed now. How about that raise? And, you know, yeah. luckily, you know, I was able to receive it, but that could have been the other way around, too. Yeah, and I should mention here, um, we should sort of say this out loud. Uh, and I like the way you, you mentioned that, Josh. I remember I, when I got licensed, uh, it was a similar sort of thing. Um, but, you know, you, most of your employers, when you actually achieve licensure, they actually bill you out at a higher rate. Um, so, you really deserve that uh, that raise uh, because they're you know uh, you're a much better architect because uh, you know a lot more about you know practicing and the ins and outs. But um, you're also more valuable as a as a you know as someone on their staff. So um, all of you, I think, should boldly go in and demand your raises. Yeah, this is you know it's a it's a tricky business. It's hard to make money. There's there's lots of reasons why things get complicated. But, uh, you know, I think it's a completely reasonable thing, you know, oh, everybody yeah. listening to this and you should spread the word that, you, you know, you should all be talking to your firms saying you should be supporting this. This is something that's worth supporting. And one of the things that I can uh, uh, absolutely say uh, is that uh, while we could all complain bitterly, if <laughs> maybe, about the exam itself, like what questions you got or how the vignettes work or, you know, any of those kinds of things. I can pretty much guarantee you you're a better architect having studied for the exam. Uh, so you know what the exam, the exam itself aside, uh, the the process of studying for it and you know uh, passing it is sort of a way of proving that you've studied for it. Is telling your firm that you actually are much better prepared to uh, to talk to clients, to you go on job sites, to. Uh, being alone in the meeting with the structural engineers and you know all of that, so uh, I absolutely uh, completely agree with uh, uh, talking to the firms and really making sure that they're out there supporting you. Yeah, which kind of ties mm -hmm. into that poll that we asked. It looks like 60% uh, of you guys basically said that you didn't have enough study time, and that was kind of what was holding you back. Next down was 42% uh, saying you were intimidated by the exam. Um, everyone else uh, was divided between uh, exam or, or exam and study materials costs or not sure where to start. Um, good to see that uh, only 9% said their firm was not supportive of pursuing licensure, although it is also sort of disappointing that it's actually that high. Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good number, though, considering we're still still kind of coming out of a recession. Yeah. Um, that's, not, that's not too bad. Uh, you know, one of the things that I highly recommend in these situations, not just because I teach one, um, but is finding an actual local class. Not everywhere has them, but if you talk to your local AIA folks or sometimes it's through the local universities, you'll find uh, courses around in different places. One of the big advantages of actually going to a class is that it, uh, it allows you to walk out the door from your office without feeling bad about it. Uh, there's always that kind of funny feeling. If you leave at five because you're gonna go study for a few hours before dinner, uh, like that just there's something kind of it just feels wrong you're leaving people behind who are still working and uh, but if you're going to a class well that's different you have to get to the class on time and so it's a I, I find that I, people have said to me many times that that's a really great way to sort of jump start the process uh, because you kind of dive in and there's a reason for you to leave and it's okay and everybody's supporting that uh, and then it's just easier once you've gone through a class on some of the topics to sit down and read through one of the guidebooks so the next question I had here uh, revolved around the vignettes, which I think I'm going to kind of skip. Um, you know, the question was, how do you handle the vignettes? And I think in some regards, it's somewhat self-explanatory. 
Uh, NCARB has uh, software that you download. Um, and basically, you know, the big idea here is, is that you want to practice the, the sample vignette that they have. Um, so just in the uh, interest of time, I'm going to kind of maybe move to a broader topic. Maybe we can kind of circle back to that, um, which leads into one of the comments you just made. Can you guys talk, and maybe we'll start, Josh, with you. Uh, did you leverage any sort of group? To, I mean, you alluded to it a little bit um, with the flashcard, the comments on the flashcard. So can you kind of elaborate on uh, whether you leverage any sort of group to help you prepare? Sure. I guess my group would be um, just other licensed architects here in, at LBBA, and then also um, one of my good friends who became licensed in November of last year. I uh, kind of relied on her to, you know, ask a lot of questions uh, to her as well. And um, besides that, I kind of mainly studied on my own. Um, I did take a few of Mike's classes as well. Um, but as far as a support group, uh, it it was mainly at some times complaining about the exam and studying for it and how dry the Kaplan books are written. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't really have a study group that kind of met once a week or anything like that. Um, but that just goes for you know throughout all my education, I was kind of very much the one that was on their own and didn't like groups so much. So um, that worked well for me, but I know for other people, um, uh, study groups work spectacularly. Yeah, I also I would say, Josh, that um, what you were just saying I think makes a lot of sense for folks who feel really comfortable talking to people in their office. Um, that, you know, in general, one of the things you'll find is that uh, other licensed architects are really mostly very excited about helping you become licensed. Yep. Uh, and so they just, you know, they don't want to butt in, and so they're not going to say anything unless you say to them, you know, hey, uh, I'm studying this this kind of topic, you know, any thoughts? Um, and I, I, th I think kind of making that happen is a really smart idea. How about you, Jennifer? Um, I did participate in the um, AIA Chicago ARE study groups. Um, I went to the the structural one and the uh, MEP one, um, just because those were some areas, like more areas of weakness for me. So I wanted to make sure I had a good background and foundation before going into the exams. Um, there was also um, at my old firm, um, you know, internal study groups. So we would do um, it was like once a week. And we'd have they, we would have someone in the office who was um, either recently passed that exam or is more specialized in that area, depending on the exam, would come in and talk. Okay. Um, and uh, how about you, Charlie? Uh, I, as much as I'm an advocate for for study groups, for a lot of the reasons that that have been mentioned. Um, I think there's a great sense of accountability that comes with just kind of sharing the process. Um, I went I went full on hermit mode. Um, I like I said I I went straight to my room every night that I got home from work. You know, like I said, I was studying on the bus. Uh, I was studying after work weekends. I'd, I'd lock myself in for at least uh, eight hours or so. Um, but I, I think there was there was something to be said for the the group. Not so much a study group, but um, the kind of the public aspect of it, because again, it was not entirely by my choice, but um, this was kind of a, a public ordeal, a, a campaign for the AIS. Um, so I had sort of a support group, um, you know, largely on social media, um, and a lot of our members and and, uh, and and other supporters who were kind of aware of the campaign. Um, uh, that kind of was my study group in the same way, you know, talking about, uh, Josh was talking about, you know, bitching about how how dry the Kaplan books are, you know, I, I always felt that I had people I could talk to about it, even if it was just sort of shouting into the wind of, of social media. Um, but, but no, as far as the actual study itself, um, largely because I knew how intensive a schedule I was setting for myself, um, I, yeah, I just went straight, straight loner, <laughs> locked myself in, and I was usually studying uh, you know, two different formats at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, uh, study groups are great. Uh, at the same time, they're not for everybody. And, you know, sometimes you find mm -hmm. yourself doing a lot of work for other people. And, like, they don't always make sense. 
but often they're really great. And so I think it's totally worth trying to find a group that, that meets and, and has some effect. But also, as Josh was saying, uh, you know, sometimes it's not a study group, it's just more of a support group. You know, you yeah. just kind of go and have a beer and, and bitch and moan about the process and, you know, share insights and, and, you know, one person buys a bunch of Kaplan books and somebody else buys a, you know, flashcards and you know, share them and, you know, that kind of thing. Like, it doesn't have to be a, okay, we're meeting every, you know, Tuesday at six and, you know, like it can be a much more sort of loose and, and sort of friendly experience as well. So um, we just uh, closed up a poll here asking folks uh, when they usually study. It looks like it's pretty overwhelming. Everyone's studying at nights and weekends. Um, and then um, a little bit, um, well, also substantially, I guess, 20% during lunch and about 20% while you're on your commute. Um, and then before and during work uh, is pretty small, 6 and 9%. So, um, so that's sort of interesting. I guess one question that... Um, that uh, that uh, let's see, Philip is has has posed, which I think is a good one maybe to to talk about at this point. Um, can you guys talk about the order that you took the exams in and why? Um, and maybe uh, let's see, Jennifer, maybe Jennifer, I'll go ahead and sort of start with you. Can you talk about the order that you moved proceeded with? Sure. So, I mean, first I talked with people who were taking the exams, got their opinions, and you know, find, figuring out which ones were the overlap, um, you know, like site planning and PPNP, there's overlap, um, and then building design construction and the systems. I don't remember exactly, but I grouped it, you know, kind of three, three, and three clumps, uh, whichever the major ones are that everyone, you know, kind of goes with, and that's how I ended up, like, attacking them. So I, I've started with the uh, building design construction systems, and then went into the the MEP one, like went towards those first, uh -huh. thinking like those are like the hardest challenges for me. Um, so that's what I started with, um, and then I did the site planning and more like vignette and schematic ones towards the end, mm -hmm. thinking those would be like more easy or less less difficult mm -hmm. towards the end. Um, yeah, that's that's how I approached it. How about you, Josh? Okay, um, so I actually started with uh, CDNS and then structural systems and BDCS, BS, PPP, SPD, and SD. That's the order I took them. Um, so the idea definitely is I saved schematic design for last because at that point I knew I wasn't going to really want to study. So I decided that one has the least amount and is mostly you know mostly just a vignette so I just went ahead and put that as last and I, I think for that one I actually um, practice vignette very very little so kind of a bad example there so make sure you practice a vignette um, but uh, my idea was really to get some of the harder ones out of the way first um, like structural systems and building systems um, I actually I, I, I do remember walking out of building systems thinking I had failed it, um, but luckily I did not. Um, and as far as starting with CDNS first, I think I was just really comfortable with construction documents at that point, although I did need to do a lot of study, studying specifically on the contract side of things for that one. Um, and in structural systems I was all, all, also familiar with as well because I had been a uh, a TA in a structural systems class for three years while I was at school as well. Okay, and how about you, Charlie? Um, I did, I basically went uh, through, as I was kind of starting from scratch, um, I went through a bunch of different um, blogs and yeah, just sort of asked friends uh, in the building who had gone through it what their advice was. Uh, I think I ultimately ended up Borrowing the most from uh, a blog called Young Architect, uh, Microsica out in Portland or somewhere in the Northwest. Um, so I ended up doing, um, I knew I wanted to cluster CDS, PPP, and SPD in a row. Um, so that was kind of a block, and I knew I'd have a weekend in the middle. Um, so I ended up doing BS, BDCS, and structures the first week, then had a weekend to sort of recalibrate uh, and then CDS, PPP, SPD and, and finish that out with, with schematic design. Um, that was uh, most most places I, I read suggested doing uh, 
uh, SD last. Um, I actually put it last because I was the least confident in it. It's the, the most subjective. Uh, and I, when I did a couple, the first couple of times I did practice vignettes for SD, uh, I wasn't going to look at the clock and just did it until it was done. And totally missed the whole don't try to do good design, just try to solve the problem thing. Uh, and I ended up spending like three times as much time as I was supposed to on those. So I was terrified about ending with SD. Um, but it was nice to get uh, kind of BS and BDCS out of the way early, um, finish that first little run uh, with structures, which I was reasonably confident in, but also knew it could be terrifying. Uh, yeah, and then diving into that second week with the three that I thought or that I had read uh, had the most overlap or the most continuity between them, um, CDS, PPP, and SPD. Um, and I, I thought it was, again, because they were all back-to-back, -back, I, I knew the, the order didn't matter a whole lot because, you know, there wasn't going to be a, a, a huge difference. But actually, something I, I didn't really think about until after I scheduled them and realized I had done accidentally was um, the timing of them in terms of how long the exam is, how many questions versus how much time for, for the vignettes. Um, again, because I was doing them back to back, I, I had a really good rhythm of sort of long, short, long. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would have thought about that. Um, you, you know, in general, uh, people ask me all the time about what the order should be, and um, you know, the answer is always uh, just you know, just do them. You know, like any order is going to be a good order. Uh, but there are some logical groupings, and I think uh, I think you guys all sort of talked about them. Uh, some are, are very specific to the moment right now, which uh, at the juncture between uh, the 4.1 and, and 5, uh, there's a few that sort of slide easily back and forth, um, CDNS, uh, PPP, and, and site planning. Uh, for example, as a group, um, if you get those done now, you can easily slide that over into the 5.0 if for some reason you decide not to finish up in, in, in the fours and you want to do it under five. So there's some reasons to get those done early. Uh, the other thing I always say is uh, somebody, I can't remember who was talking about it, but somebody mentioned um, the kind of weirdness about going on your first time. Um, you know, the, I guess Charlie, but maybe it was you, the um, talking about the the you know metal detector and the you know all the kind of craziness and I'm sure it's different at different locations but um, it's a very alien experience to go into one of these testing centers and none of the people there know or care anything about architecture you know it's a testing center the person next to you could be testing on you know being a, a private detective or a beautician or something uh, so it it's a very alien strange place and you're not allowed to bring anything in and it's sort of funny some places won't even let you bring a code in and uh, you know, so just choosing one as a starting one that you feel is the most comfortable possible, and that way going in to start, you're like you're not as worried. You're starting with one that you feel comfortable with. I think that's really one of the keys as well. Um, but then also, as Jennifer said, there's a few that have sort of logical overlays, and it's probably smart to do those together, um, like systems and and building systems. So I'm going to go ahead and. Um I think this is a good time to ask this question. Um, and the question is going to be, what are your suggestions for keeping your morale up uh, during the process? And so by that, I actually mean you know, both um, passing the, um, the exam, but also failing the exam. Um, I mean, that can be, um, most people I know uh, fail at least one section of the exam. I, I know I failed, I failed one of them myself. Um, and so, you know, the way you handle that um, is unique. So I'll start with Josh. Josh, what are your suggestions for keeping your morale up during the process and, and dealing with the, you know, failing a, a section of the exam, but then also passing one? Okay. Well, um, so one thing I actually did was I kind of made a day out of each exam. I, um, first thing was the day before the exam, I usually took off work just to kind of relax and get into a zone where I wasn't so stressed out about things. Um, the second was the idea of rewarding myself after the exam. And this is going to sound incredibly nerdy, but after every single exam, I went to the CAF and bought a Lego kit, and that's what I did the evening <laughs> that's after awesome. the exam. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> 
Um, and so going back to when I failed PPP, um, as bad as this is to say, once I started uh, finding out that not only had one of my other friends also failed it, but three of my other friends failed that same section, I felt a little better about it. Um, it was just one of those, all right, well, maybe failing an exam is part of it. And the real you know, story of it is going back, taking it, passing it, and being like, hey, whatever. you know. So what, I failed one. I ended up passing it at the end, passed them all, got my license. Um, and then the end of it, um, at the very end, after I got my license, just had a huge party with a bunch of my friends, went to this um, great German restaurant in Logan Square, and then after to a bar and made a hell of a night out of it. And <laughs> awesome. That's what it was. Cool. Uh, Jennifer, how about yourself? Oh, that's awesome. Uh, no, I definitely think it's important to kind of create incentives, you know, to keep your morale going and um, definitely reward yourself after you take an exam. You know, you, you don't know, like, immediately if you passed or failed, but, I mean, you just spent, like, a whole month studying and you're exhausted, so might as well just, like, let loose a little bit and just, yeah, reward yourself, go out, just go out, have fun. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, it's, you know, it's a big mountain you're climbing. It's hard to think, like, oh, I passed one, I have, like, five more to go. Or, oh, I failed one, oh, I have, to, like, so many more to go. But it's, I think it's more about just taking that moment right there and just relaxing and um, celebrating your mini, mini milestone um, so you can keep going. Awesome. You, you know, I, I love the fact, uh, the idea of giving yourself a reward for taking the exam even more than for passing it. Like, it's great when you pass it, you should definitely have a big party and do all that. But the process of feeling positive and studying and, you know, lining it up and making it happen, uh, I think that's a really great way. And I really like the idea of having those be kind of memorable things. Like in, in Josh's example, you know, the Legos, like those, those Legos are going to be sitting in his office or in his house, you know, forever because those will be the, the exam Legos, right? Uh, or maybe it's, you know, it's a different restaurant uh, that you've always wanted to go to for each different exam or something like that. And you kind of use that as a way to kind of uh, celebrate the fact that you've put the time in. And you know, if you have to do it again, you get to go to another restaurant. It's all good. <laughs> yep. How about you, Charlie? Um, yeah, a lot of the same things. It's, you know, celebrating every small victory. Um, <laughs> Did you go out after like every no. day and, and, and <laughs> That's right. you know, drink yourself? Uh, drink, drink himself to oblivion right. every night and then wake up the next morning and take <laughs> another exam? <laughs> right. I, th there was a Buffalo Wild Wings across the street from the testing center, so I, after the exam, I'd usually go out and grab a beer while I waited for my wife to come get me. <laughs> nice. um, but no, like the, celebrating not even just taking the exam and passing the exam, but like making a plan or, or scheduling the exam, like celebrate scheduling the exam, tell people about it, and be like, all right, this is real now. Um, but also, yeah, just in, in making that plan and in sitting down and actually making a realistic plan for how much time you can commit to it, building into that time to breathe and step back from it because if you if you say okay this is exactly how many hours I can spare for the exam this is everything that's not mandatory you know sleep or work um, if you burn yourself out studying too hard you, you're not useful uh, and you're not going to retain things um, so it's better to make a realistic plan that involves some downtime some plan time to think about other things um, than, to, than to try and cram um, all the way leading up to it and burn yourself out and, and fail and then have to do it all over again. Um, so yeah, as part of like building time to relax into your study plan, I think is, is huge. And, and again, yeah, celebrating, celebrating every small victory. I went to Mexico. That was, that was pretty great. <laughs> Mexico, nice. Uh, and yes, that was uh, Mark uh, making sure I spelled breathe right. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, what was the point I was going to make? I forgot it. Uh, okay, so I want to sort of conclude here. We're getting close to the end of our hour. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure you all, after passing the ARE, um, have some general advice that now uh, you know you probably give to folks in your firms. Can you share your general advice for preparing and passing the ARE? Um, and I'll start with uh, Charlie. We'll start with you. Um, I would say the biggest thing. Uh, 
I could say is just to commit. Um, you you really you have to want it badly enough to know that it's going to mean um, you know sacrificing things you normally enjoy that you know happy hour or sporting events or you know whatever it is knowing that this has to take precedence for however long you give yourself uh, you know and commit to it schedule the exam and then hold yourself to that deadline um, you, you like I said you you got to want it um, but it's if you do it right it's absolutely worth it. Um, I think another thing is, is really, in the more specific sense, um, identifying your city style, knowing that not everybody um, works best just reading a study guide. I, I'm a terribly slow reader. I knew that was ne it, I was never going to be able to read study guides cover to cover and retain a word. So trying out different um, formats like audio guides, uh, videos, flashcards, practice exams, um, you know, find, find the method that works best for you. Great. Um, and Jennifer? Sure, yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, I'll just kind of build upon that, and one of my big tips and advice would be just create a support group. Um, you know, make sure, you, you know, tell your friends and your family, like, it's really, it's a big, like, change and process that you're going through, um, taking this whole, all the exams, so just make sure you have a good support group. And I would also add that just create an action plan that's you know that's attainable and realistic. Um, like you're the, like you're the one who's going to be going through this and studying. Um, you, you know you have jobs, you have families. Um, just make make a plan that's realistic and that you can stick to so that um, you can get get through with it. And Josh, I actually I agree with Jennifer's. Uh create an action plan. I I think, for instance, if I were to do the seven and seven days, I would have given up after about day four, and I would have been like, screw it, I'm going to go grab a beer. Um, <laughs> I had that weekend. That was important. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, um, yeah, what I would suggest to people in the firm now is utilize uh, the knowledge that is found in the office itself. Um, be it through if there are study guides or other materials in the office or all of us who um, have our license now, you know, as Mike said, we're more often than not very, very interested and willing to help. Um, and then also, um, I would say don't think that you need, um, need to just follow just one uh, style of study and be it just do strictly study guides or the flashcards or YouTube videos or even the live classes. I think it was good for me to mix it up um, and I think it's a good thing to do too especially if you have the resources for it because um, there were in some aspects um, I forget exactly which exams but there were a couple exams where the flashcards to me were much more helpful than the study guide. Um, and then there was another exam where the study guide was very helpful. And even for structural systems, um, it ended up being what helped me most was that the, t uh, the professor that I had been a TA for, all of his slides from that class ended up helping me out quite a bit versus the study guide. So yeah, there's tons of materials out there to use. and. You almost just kind of have to figure out which mix works for you. Yeah, those are those are really great comments. I, I couldn't agree more with all of those. Uh, I, I think the, the gist of, of uh, finding a support group like we talked about, uh, like creating that support group and, and just getting people together and having them be on your side, I think is, is huge. But it's also really about finding your own system for that. Like, uh, you know, some people really like the idea that they can kind of do this on the down low and, and nobody really knows about it and then they can just say, you know, pop up and say, hey, I'm, I'm licensed now uh, because they don't want to have the pressure of everybody asking them all the time uh, about it. Well, that's fine. If you're that person, don't, don't tell anybody. Just, you know, find, find the group of people who, who need to know or find the group of people who are just going to help you kind of no matter what and don't need to know. Uh, uh, if you're the person who really is like, I got to be on a team, I got to, I got to have, you know, I got to be part of a process. Otherwise, I just can't, you know, I, I find myself just going home and watching TV or something. Well, then 
create that, you know, make that happen. There's tons of opportunity around uh, if, you, if you look around. People come up to me all the time and ask me uh, questions about these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'll say is, well, have you talked to your firm? Like, do, do you have, uh, does the firm have uh, study materials? And people will say, oh, you know, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't actually spoken to anybody at the firm about it. And it's like, why on earth not? You know, like, you should absolutely yeah. find out. It's probably, as Josh said, people there willing to help you. Uh, but there's also probably uh, study guide material that's just sitting around. Now, some of it may be a few years old because it depends on how big a firm it is and how, you know, recently they've been updating. But, you know, the exam is still... 85%, 90% the same exam it was 20, 25 years ago. Uh, there's only a few sort of uh, a few issues that have changed sustainability, a few contract things, some other stuff like that uh, that are really wildly different. Uh, the vast majority is still the same. Like you can use old stuff to get started. And, and so it's like check in with people and find out. The other thing is if you haven't Dove, if you haven't really jumped in yet and you, you're looking for a way that your firm can be helpful, think about it from a sort of standpoint of, uh, well, you know, I really don't know anything about um, how the contracts work. Well, offer to be part of the contract negotiation on one of the upcoming projects so that you can sort of find out what's going on and make sure they understand that you're there in order to learn about contracts. Uh, and you know, that you can do some of the legwork of, you know, looking for typos and doing that kind of thing. But in fact, what you're really doing is talking to people, asking questions about why this, why that, why do they care? Uh, and you'll find that that kind of real information kind of in the field will make a huge difference when you start reading a guidebook in a very dry sense. Uh, Josh, I think, was mentioning uh, trying to sit down and just read the, the contracts that he felt very comfortable with CDNS, but, but not so much with the contracts. When you just sit down and start reading the contracts, man, they're about as boring as can be. But if you've actually talked to somebody about uh, why they're, they want to change a contract or why one word is being X'd out and another word is being put in, suddenly it has a context and it's much, much easier to, to then read those things. I think the same would be true about going on to a job site. Uh, whenever you can, if there's like sort of an old salt around uh, in your firm, somebody who's been around a long time and has a lot of experience, go on the job site with them and actually specifically say to them, hey, look, I'm you know, coming up to uh, you know, take an exam on you know, building design and construction systems. Uh, you know, I just want to walk around with you and look at different materials. You know, tell me what you know, you know and talk to the contractors. The contractors love, love, love telling architects about what they should know. Uh, and it's a really great way of uh, making more rapport, but also getting real information about, uh, you know, the kind of how they see the world. And that's just as important on a lot of these exams, how the owner sees the world, how the contractor sees the world, how the architects see the world. Uh, so I absolutely just, you know, kind of jump in is the big thing. Find the one that works for you. Um, and the other thing to say, and I think it's always really important in these moments, you know, in the poll uh, we saw earlier that uh, a lot of people just kind of, you know, they don't know where to start or they, they feel uncomfortable. Um, and the thing to say here is everybody feels uncomfortable and nobody knows where to start. You just got to start. Uh, and the corollary that goes with that is you can very, very easily take one of these exams that you feel reasonably positive about and then it turns out you fail it. And it turns out because there was some weird thing in the vignette or you got a bunch of questions on contracts that you were contracts you didn't know about or, you know, like things can just, you can just get an unfortunate grouping of, of questions. Don't worry about it. You know, it's okay. Uh, think of this as a process and you're sort of making your way through that process. And if you fail a few along the way, it's not a big deal. Uh, the key is learn from that as a, pro as a, as a way of doing it and uh, make sure that you are you know, pulling and analyzing yourself as you're going along. So don't just uh, do study material, you know, don't just read a contract, you know, mark it up as you read it. Uh, as you read the guidebook about the contract, mark up the two between each other. Uh, as you uh, go on a job site, you know, make notes about what was being talked about on the job site. Like, do things that actually make uh, stuff stick in your brain 
uh, and find those relationships between the kind of real life experience you're having working for a firm and the guidebook type of experience that you're looking for uh, for studying. And you'll find that the more that you can do that, the easier it'll be to retain that information and the more useful it'll be uh, on the exam itself. Awesome, well that's great adv uh, advice and all, Mike. Um, but I have to say that I think the thing that I got from this was that we need to come up with a hashtag for the best ways to celebrate uh, taking an ARE section. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's the best. That's best totally the best, uh, best plan. And the other thing to say, like we said earlier, is uh, absolutely talk to your firms. And if they aren't doing anything, get the other licensed architects on board to help you and say, you should be you should be helping this guy. You should be making, yeah. uh, you know, making sure that, that this, uh, this, uh, young person taking the exam is is being supported you should be uh, you know making sure we've got study guides around uh, like I said it you everybody has complaints about the exam but it's always a positive to have studied for it uh, it's going to be a benefit for every office yeah. so if they're not helping they should be helping uh, and you know we should we should have that be loud and clear out and out into the industry yeah, yeah. awesome all right well we'll go ahead and end it there um, uh, I really want to thank uh, you, Jennifer and Charlie and Josh, for sharing your stories with us. Um, yeah, I think you can kind of, if you could, we could all just take a moment and just imagine that every all all of the folks who attended are all standing and clapping for you right now. Yes. They're all on mute, so we can't hear it, but that's what they're all doing right now. So thank you so much um, uh, for sharing thank your you. stories with us, um, and of course, thank you, Mike. Um, I would just want to say when all of you who are listening and tuned in, you know, when you guys pass the ARE, you know, please let us know. Um, uh, email us at hello at blackspectacles.com so that you can be um, the person who we feature um, on our next um, How They Pass the ARE episode because we'd really like to kind of, uh, kind of keep this uh, uh, keep this kind of uh, revolving idea going here. Or if you have a good reward. Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, I think I am serious. We are going to create a uh, hashtag best way to celebrate passing the ARE. Um, so, uh, so for all of you tuned in, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, uh, which will be uh, on our building systems mock exam, uh, again, you can register at blackspectacles.com slash podcast. Um, just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers uh, with us for live feedback during the broadcast. And thank you everyone today for both um, uh, answering uh, the poll questions, which I think is really interesting, uh, but also providing your questions and feedback throughout the session. Um, to learn more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, um, go to blackspectacles.com, or as I mentioned, you can try out any of the free course videos. And for those of you who are uh, who are ready and committed to start preparing for the ARE, um, and if you're already an AIA member, as a part of our partnership with the AIA, you can visit a special URL to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your AIA ARE prep membership. And that URL is http colon slash slash bksp.es slash 10-21-15 webinar, which is of course today's date, 10-21-15 webinar. And you can get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your AIA ARE prep membership. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. <laughs>